right. Good morning, everybody. Oh, where did my thing go? Ah, it looks like it's working. Good morning. Um, my name is Samantha Mirabal. I'm with Melka's application team. And um, today we're going to be going over any questions you might have. So be sure to type them in on the thread down here under comments um, if you have any questions. So type them in and we'll uh, try to get them answered. If you have them ahead of time and you don't think you think about them during the week, you can email them to applications at melco.com and we'll get them added to the list. Um, but other than that, I'll start off with uh, good morning, Margaret. Um, I'll start off with the questions that I was sent um, ahead of time. And after that, I will keep looking shifty eyed over at the other side because that is where I can see the comments on my other um, uh, on my other screen. Keep in mind, I did good morning. Um, I can only see four comments at a time, so if you, if I miss a question, I deeply apologize. I'll cover it, or if someone can remind me later, that would be great. All right, so these are the, good morning, everybody. All right, so these are the questions that I've got so far. Um, when doing a traditional fill, can you set the stitch orientation by degree, um, or do you just have to use a stitch direction tool? You can set it by degree, so let's do that. Um... So how do you create a fill? Right here, you'll, yeah, it's showing up, okay. So right here is our um, complex fill. You can also do insert complex. It'll all get you to the same spot, which is to create your fill. If you've never done a fill before, good morning, Diane, um, down here is your little cheat sheet of what it's expecting you to do. So I click around whatever shape, left clicks give you straight clicks, Right clicks give you curves. When you're done creating whatever shape you want, you hit enter to close the shape. Um, I have no holes. If you have a hole, you draw a hole. So I'm going to hit enter to bypass that step. Give it a start point, a stop, and a stitch direction. So the question was, can you specify that stitch direction? Yes. So if you go into the properties, right here you'll see stitch angle. So you can change it to be whatever you want, 0, 90, 180, 60, 30. Um, so if you have a specific angle that you want right here under stitch angle, you can change it to your heart's content. Now keep in mind with this, you can also do other stuff with the fill rather than having a basic fill. Um, you can add patterns to it. So um, let's say you want to add, I'll zoom in so you could actually see it. Um, so you can get different patterns in here. These pattern fills are a ton of fun. Um, so for instance, this brick. Now, if you're using these pattern fills, one of the things that I would suggest is every time you select it, the very first thing you should do is come up here and change it to satin. Um, and you'll see it makes it look so much neater as an effect. All right, so the stitch angle, again, double click on the element. Over here, you'll see the angle. You can change it to whatever you want and it will adjust accordingly. Okay, good morning. All right, so that was our first question, which was, um, can you specify the angle? Yes. Another question was, when using a single zigzag underlay, the zigzag stitches are really wide. Is there a way to change that? Um, yes and no. Um, yes, you can change it to be lesser, but the I assume what you're, ask, you're saying is, hey, I had some big shape. How big is this? So this shape is pretty large. Uh, 4.8 by 3.3. .3. So if on that I come to my underlay and instead of using auto I change that to let's say a zigzag. All right, The border margin is how close to the edge it's going to get. So if I turn this off where you can actually see the underlay um, there, there it is. Okay, So you can see here it's going from there over here back to this side well, first off, how close is it getting to the edge? Well, that's what this border margin is. So it's getting 10 points from the edge of my wireframe right here, all right? But it is doing jumps. So it's making a needle penetration here. It's jumping way over here, 10 points from the other edge. It's gonna do a needle penetration. And it's gonna go back and forth doing that, dragging these super long pieces of thread along. Um, so I personally don't use, well, Depending on what speed you're sewing, that's also a recipe for disaster because if you're sewing super fast, um, you risk the needle bending and if it flexes and then it goes to sew, you break a needle. So I would, I don't use this for um, 
large elements at all. I just go straight to a fill underlay because then I can specify it however I want to um, put your underlay there. Now, if you look at the auto underlay right here and you click on the box with the three dots, that will show you what auto is doing. All right. So what you can see here is the zigzag. It's only using for mid-range elements. And what I mean by that, 40 points to 60 points, pretty much under a quarter of an inch. Not too small because if it gets really narrow and you try to put a zigzag under something that's super thin anyway, it's just going to look like a straight line. Um, so for your mid-size, not too large, not too small, just right, you get your zigzag. Um, and then when you get into the larger elements, it goes to a fill. So that would be my suggestion. Good morning, Julia. All right. So, and Alexandra. Good morning, Todd. All right, so that is our second question. I guess I'll quit calling everyone's name. <laughs> All right. Um, if I send design to both machines and it says great on one, not so great on the other, what do I do? Um, I would start off by looking. I would have to look at it to tell you what to make suggestions at, look at the different sew outs, but my first off suggestion would be look at your active feed settings um, and make sure that you're not running super tight on one and super loose on the other machine. So that would be my starting point. Um, you can always, uh, you know, adjust up and down there. Um, you might also look into your auto compensation, which is, I don't have my OS installed here, but if you go into tool settings somewhere in there, there's um, an auto compensation table. See if one of the machines have that and the other machine doesn't, and you can make them match. That might be another um, area to look. Okay, with, and that's within the OS, not within Design Shop. Okay, another question was, eek, I got rid of my, um, the menu on the right-hand side. What do I do? Okay, so where's Design Shop? Here it is. So, I've done this before as well. So you come over here and you think you're closing the design. Next thing you know, you close that. And now your project view is gone. Okay, so what do you do? Well, it's that thing over there is called a project view. So a lot of people think it's a toolbar. So they'll come over here and they'll say, hey, all my toolbars are on. Eh, it's still not there. What is it? It's a project view. So if you go view, project view, and turn that back on, voila, it'll appear over on your um, right-hand side here. Okay. So that is how you get to your project view. Um, what other questions? Anyone have any typed in? I don't see any yet. Okay. Um, so there was a few questions. Um, how do you bend or angle text to fit a circle patch? And what should you do about small lettering? All right, so let's look at a few of those. So back to design shop. I'm gonna close the mess I've made. Actually, I'm just going to close everything. We'll go again. All right. So if I'm going to make a circle patch, one, I need to draw a circle, right? And then I got to add some text to it. So an easy way to draw a circle is you do a walk input. Down here on the left-hand side, you'll see this automatic circle input. If you click on that, now first click is a point, drag down, left click again. If I hold my shift key down while I move my arrow, notice how um, it locks to a perfect circle. If I let go of that, now I get ovals, right? So shift locks it. So now I have a circle. I can center it using this right here. So now it's centered around the origin, which is these red cross hatches. All right, so now I have a circle, but what size is it? Well, it's currently 3.8 in size. So let's say I want that to be four, well, whatever size you want, all right? So you can make it a four. Now we need to add some text to it, right? So I'm just gonna click on there and say, oops, T-E-X-T, -E arc. All right, so we have some text, <laughs> um, much too large text. So I'm gonna go down to the micro fonts. When you're dealing with tiny, small lettering, the micro fonts work really well. Um, and you see in the code sheet here, it gives you a recommended a recommended size whether you're doing you know something a little less than a quarter inch so try to stick within those um, size recommendations I'm just going to change it to that one and change this to a height of 0.3 so I did that kind of fast I just clicked up here and said 0.3 okay when it's the text is selected all right now from here I want to arc it 
So if I double click on it or right click, go to properties or over here in your project view, I can select the lettering, right click, go to properties. All of it takes you to the exact same point, which is this object property box. To arch the text, you change your line, line type to arc, hit apply, and then you can adjust this box right here by grabbing that handle and dragging it until you get it a, a, you know, placed where you want. Okay, so from here, now if we're doing this as a patch, most people don't want just a straight line like that as a patch. So we would need to make that a satin line. Our satin stitch is going to be our single line center. So if you select your walk input, hold the trick is hold a shift key. All right. Um, so if you hold your shift key and then click on single line center, shift is to add, control is to replace. So I don't want to replace this line. I just want to add. So I'm going to hold shift, click on my single line center, which is this icon right here. And now you'll see I have a walk input and a single line. That's pretty narrow. So let's make that something wider. Okay. Helps if num numlock is on. There we go. All right. So I got 40 points. Um, so if we now think about how will we make this as a patch, you generally need a placement stitch, a tack down stitch, something to hold the fabric. So now it's just an exercise in copy and paste, right? So copy paste that walk input, change the color that allows me to have an applique stop. Um, I can take my single line center, copy it, and then change this to maybe a tackle that will give me that zigzag and make that closer to maybe 30, 25, I don't know, personal preference. Yeah, that shift trick is awesome. I agree. All right, so I'm going to, now I've got, I'm going to turn that mess off. There we go. All right, so I've got a walk, another walk, I've got a zigzag, and then I've got my actual satin stitch that forms the pattern. I generally want to do that last, so let's move the text up. So now you just, you know, keep on working on your design work to get the size you want. So with lettering, make sure that you're paying attention to um, your kerning, right? So lettering that's spaced weird, like even here, I'd still go re Hey, out. I'm on. Sorry, my children. <laughs> so... What was I doing? Okay, kerning. And then underlay, particularly if you're just getting started, this auto underlay works really well. Um, so I, you know, until you figure out what your personal preferences are, I would look at that. And I know in this pack, past Wednesdays, Wednesdays Live, um, they were talking about the sheer importance of your tie-ins and tie-outs. Um, and I got to echo what they said there. You can't underestimate the importance of having a good lock stitch because making sure... The thread is locked in when you start, so that's, I always joke that that's, you know, for my benefit, right? So when I start, I don't want that top thread dragging around. I want it to lock in so that I don't have to accidentally have that thread dragging around or, worst case, unthread the needle, which is just a nuisance, right? So having a tie-in gets you started on a good foot. The tie-off your customers care about, right? Because no one enjoys having things come in coming undone in the laundry um, or just through standard use. So making sure you have a tie off stitch gets that good lock stitch so that things don't come undone over time. Okay. This auto trim length, I automatically just changed it. It's a pet peeve of mine. Um, I can't stand these little jump stitches through here um, because you'll notice the default is a 64 point. Um, auto trim. So what that is actually saying is from where one letter ends to where the next one starts, if that distance is less than this number, whatever number is in this box, it's going to just drag a piece of thread along and keep going. A 64 point line is close to a quarter of an inch. Um, that's a pretty long piece of thread to drag around. So I personally um, prefer this closer to 20. Um, if it's smaller than 20, most people aren't going to notice it anyway, so I just leave it. But that is a complete personal preference. I know other people think 30 is the magic number. Um, some hate all of them, and they'll actually put this really small, so everything trims. I personally would not suggest doing that, especially if you're doing tiny lettering. 
um, because if you're not moving enough, you're just going to be, you know, doing a trim and then starting back nearly where you just ended. It's just not a good idea. So there's that. All right. What else? So what were the questions now that I completely derailed? Um, all right. How do we arc it? Anything specific? Okay, so uh, on the small lettering front, there is an excellent presentation that was done last year um, by Scott on tiny lettering. It's about 45 minutes. If you haven't, I know I do this more on nearly every live, but I figure not everyone watches them all, so it's hopefully worth it. If you go to melco-service.com, and right here there's this FAQ, area. If you haven't um, looked at that, do so. There's a, a large amount of information that can be found there. But small lettering. I just searched that. This first one, let's see what we got. So here is all some good guidelines on um, lettering. They also give you the links to the videos. There's more resources here. I mean, there's just a ton of information. Um, with how to get tiny lettering done nicely, you know, it from needle selection to speed to, um, you know, how you're sewing on the machine, your thread selections, underlay. I mean, this lesson right here is really nice and thorough that goes into a lot of the specifics of what you want to look for when you're dealing with tiny lettering. Okay. All right. What else do we have? Um, I talked about that, talked about those. Those were all the ones I was sent in ahead of time. So does anyone have any other questions that you'll want to go over? I'll hold up for a few, for a minute or so, give people a chance to type in. Look a little foolish at the moment, tell you. Is everyone enjoying <laughs> sitting around? Our state's kind of opening, so that's cool. Um, oh, patch making. Um, I know it comes up a lot. In some of the groups, there's a document that was put up a while back on patches that has all kinds of resources. Um, I think last year, there's a, I did a video, um, it's on Melco's page for creating patches, so there's different techniques there that you can use. So there's a lot of fun stuff. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions being typed in so before my kids decide to bust in again. We might call it a day. So, yeah, just to show one more time, the shift trick, select whatever object, hold shift, and then click on whatever you want it to convert to. So this line, if I want to make it a fill, I hold my shift key down and click on that. There's the fill. Um, if I want to now take this and make it, I don't want to fill, let's say, I go, I don't want that. I want it to be a satin line. Well, instead of holding shift, I hold control and click on single line center, which is this icon here, and you'll see that is, it'll take that fill and replace it. So control is for replacing, shift is for adding. That same functionality is right here under change element from one type to another. So it lets you think about it. So if you go, okay, I want that to be a complex fill. Do I want to add it so I keep that single line or do I want to replace it? Well, let's replace it. Now my single line's gone. All right, so someone posted in the links under the comments for creating patches and also a link for the past videos um, so that you have those for reference. But any other questions for you? Ah. Um, what is the best options for sewing on plush blankets? So when you're working with anything that has texture, um, there's a variety of different techniques you can use. One of the key things you always have to do is use a topper. So if you do nothing else, put a topper down on it. Um, so, all right, so patches, I'll go back over that in a minute. All right, so make sure you use a topper on there because otherwise when you go to sew it, you'll end up with that fur just poking through everywhere and um, really obfuscating your text, right? So by putting a topper on there, that helps. Now there are a whole lot of different techniques and videos that we've created on doing a primer stitch, which is kind of like an, a global underlay that is pretty wide. So let's close this and let's start over. 
I'll come back to the circle. I haven't forgotten that. Okay, so let's say name. Oh, that's awful. Name. There we go. All right, so let's say I want to put a name on a blanket, and I or I always think of it as um, stockings because they have that same texture that goes over and eats. You know, we'll kind of fuzz it over. So you can always go and create yourself what I call a global underlay. It's a primer stitch, but you cr take your complex fill and you know trace around however you want. I'm just doing using left clicks and going outside of the shape a little bit. And then I'm gonna hit enter to close it. I don't want any holes. I'm gonna give it a start point, a stop point, and a stitch direction. And I'm gonna put that by left clicking and dragging, I'm gonna drag it in front of my text. Okay, so that it's behind it. Now when you're sewing on a blanket, you really don't want, or I don't want, a solid fill behind my name. So you can come into the properties and now we're gonna play games. So I'm gonna change it to a Trapunto and let's try a density of 30. Under underlay, I'm gonna turn all that off and I'm gonna use a fill underlay and change the border margin to zero. And then my angle, let's change that to 90. That's cute. Oh, let's make that 30 since I did the first one. All right, so what did I just do? All right, border margin of zero means that my underlay is gonna go right to the edge of my wireframe. Okay, so that's what that is. The density is how far apart these lines are spaced. Okay, so they're 30 points um, from line to line. So if I want more stitching in there, closer, uh, lighter or closer fill, more coverage, I would decrease that number. If I want them more open, so I don't need that dense of a coverage, I can increase that number. Um, you'll see, it's just again a personal preference. Whatever I have my density set to on the underlay, I like the top one to be that as well because it makes these pretty little squares. Um, so that can give you what some like to call a knockdown. It's just an underlay, right? So if you match that to the color of your fabric, so put a top, put a topper down, run this underlay stitch, and then put your text on top of it. That way, you know, even if the fuzz starts coming around to eat it, um, to cover up, it's not going to completely encroach upon your name because it's being held down by the thread underneath. So I, you know, I like to do um, to match that to the color of the garment I'm sewing on. Um, the blanket, the towel, the stocking, whatever it is. Okay. So what else? So another question was, on a circle, um, can you make it thicker so when making patches it's stronger? Yeah, of course. So the width of that circle is being driven by the width of a single line center. So a single line, which that's kind of a circular statement. <laughs> See what I did there? Anyway. Uh, so... A single line center is a constant width column, essentially. So you have satin stitches going from one side to another with your width being this many points, whatever that is. All right. So from this side to that side, it's 20 points. If I want it wider, I can just change my width to be a bigger number. Okay. I have auto underlay turned on. So you'll see that's what's happening here. It went from just being a center walk to now it's got an edge walk and a zigzag running through there. Okay, so you can change this to whatever you want. Now keep in mind, you, practically speaking, you don't want to make that, you know, I wouldn't want to do this for a bunch of reasons. Make it really large. One, you'll see with my settings, it's already, com it's converting it over into fill. Now I can bypass that, but the longer a stitch goes from one side to the other, the, the more prone it's going to be to snagging, right? So uh, you'll notice in the properties, Uh, hang on one second. All right, so you'll notice in the properties right here, use fill for stitch lines greater than. That's if any individual stitch gets longer this, than this no, number right here, it'll convert it to a fill. So if I knew this was 100 and I set this to 105, notice I have now a satin stitch. That's not a good practice in general. It's too long. 100, 105 is, goodness, well over a quarter inch because um, 60 is around a quarter inch, so you're getting an, into a really long piece of thread. And if imagine that's on a left chest pocket, right? If I have a pen going in and out, it's going to snag it. And nobody likes it when um, you ruin embroidery that way. So 
the default is 60. So I, you know, I would try to say no satin stitches longer than 60 points for patches. Um, I don't know, 40 works pretty well. Um, when you have a circle, my machine always stops at the same place at the top and bottom with no error. I just need to start again. Do you know why it's doing this? Had it digitized by Q digitizing. Um, no, I don't know why it's doing it. If I had to ask questions to find out why, I would start off with what are your active feed settings and is your um, cable tension good? So if your X cable, have you checked its tension? Is it right? And then what is your active feed? If your active feed is much too high, um, then it might be thinking it's a, you know, a thread break when it's not. Um, also look at your bobbin tension, make sure you have that correct. So in other words, you know, check your active feed settings, check your bobbin tension. Um, and that's the first place I would start. But without seeing the design and playing with it, if I wouldn't know for sure, but that's where I would start. How can I make lettering thick without redigitizing the whole thing? I use block lettering and it looks skimpy. Yay. I like talking about that. All right, so here. So when if you're looking at things and in embroidery, things are going to shrink, right? Because it, it always makes sense to me. If I make a stitch here and I'm pulling at high speed over to this side, well, the thread going through this hole that was made with a needle as it's pulling, that hole's going to try to shift this way, right? So imagine this whole row of stitches is trying to move to my right. Um, so this, when it makes a stitch here, now it's going to be going the opposite way. So all these holes are going to be trying to shift left, right? So what is your net effect? Your net effect is your columns are going to shrink. They're going to narrow up a little bit. When that happens, you know, there's a lot of techniques you use to minimize that. So hoop well, use good stabilizers, um, use excellent underlays, but then you know it's going to shrink some, so you want to compensate for it. So that's what you're going to do to make it bolder, is we're going to add some pull compensation. So if you go in, double click on the text, under here you'll see pull comp. And there's pull comp by percent, and there's pull comp by offset. I don't ever use pull comp by percent, and let me show you why. Let's say I've got a square. I'm going to change the stitch angle so it's more obvious what I'm doing. There we go. All right. So if I have a square and or square-ish, I come over to my pull properties and let's say I make that 120%. Hmm. Doesn't really look like a square much anymore, right? So because what's happening? Yeah. So the gap, uh, Alexandra. The gap, um, this is the same thing we're talking about, is pull compensation, which is why that's happening. So um, by doing percentage, what that's doing, it's going to overstitch this edge just a little bit, right? Well, 120% from one side to the other is a short number, so 20% of a, sh of a small number is going to be an overstitch of a small number. By the time you get down here, that's a really long distance, so 20% is... A much larger so it you can introduce distortions into it when you're using pull by percent um, I can recall getting clients call and say hey you know I've I'm trying to make my text look thicker I'm you know I've changed the pull comp to 180 and now it just looks a little funny it's thicker but it's still not quite right and my text is looking weird well what's happening is you're introducing distortion to it right so rather than that I usually leave it at a hundred and I'm going to do a really stupid number just so you can see the effect easily. Okay, so 15 is not one you would want to do on a practical basis. But all this does is you're telling it how far to overstitch off the edge, right? So one point, two point. Someone's here sewing. Can you shut the door? All right, so the hopefully the noise isn't noisy. All right. So 15 points, it's going to overstitch there, and that is your pull offset, right? So practically speaking, I like one to three points for offset. It's enough to make it bolder and to account for the fact that columns are going to narrow up without being obsessive, um, excessive about it, okay? Now, let's say for the question on the circle. So if I have a circle shift... 
and I'm going to copy paste that, use my control key on the first one, and change it to a fill. So I think what you're saying is what you're getting is when you go to sew it, it looks like this, kind of, without the underlay there, where you're getting gaps between there. That's because things are shrinking. So what you want to make sure you're doing is have a good underlay that um, you're stabilizing the edge as well, that you have it hooped nicely, that you're using appropriate stabilizers, and then compensate for that, that effect by adding some pull comp. So, you know, one to three points generally does it. And I don't know, depending on what you're doing, I don't do line to line digitizing. Personally, I like to have, you know, a few points of overlap just to kind of add, add a protection, if you will. <laughs> All right. Um, what other questions do we have? It doesn't even look like you can hear the machines going. Cool. All right. Any other questions? Well, I hope this was helpful for y'all. Again, my name's Samantha. Remember to um, send in your questions to applications at melco.com. You can type them in on the thread and any that we don't see um, today, I'll try to add to next week's questions. But uh, remember, on Wednesday, there's always a live. Um, there's Digital Monday and Tuesday. There's a bunch of them. But check them out. Send us in your questions, different things you want to hear about, and we will get them added to our list. All right. I hope this was helpful for you today. Uh, stay safe, and I will talk to you guys next time.